concerned. Said connection lost. Retry. There's nothing worse than having a connection lost when you're trying to talk about God. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> I brought my coffee up here. I hope you don't mind this morning. Good morning. So very glad to see everybody here today, uh, and and I really I really do mean that. Uh, I know that the, the good Lord is happy when folks gather together to adore Him, uh, and that's really what worship is. So we sing together, we pray together, we do those things that the first century Christians did, because that's what God wants. That's what He likes. That's what He enjoys. Scripture talks about sweet aroma. Uh, of, of worship rising up to him, and, and that's what we want to be for our God. We're continuing our study through the first Corinthian letter. And this, uh, this book, this epistle, this writing that Paul wrote to the brethren in Corinth, uh, it lists a lot of problems that they're trying to work through, they're, that he wants them to grasp a good understanding of. Uh, we know that the information that he shares with them is information that was supposed to be shared with the other uh, congregations uh, of the Lord's body uh, in that area. And so we know that some of them had these issues as well. In this particular section of Scripture, begin, beginning in chapter 11, Verse 2, we're going to be reading through verse 16, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> through verse 16, and it covers the problem of women in the church. Now, don't get too lost in that, uh, <laughs> in that title. That's just, that's just, uh, you know, honestly, I would think that a better and and you're going to see why I say this toward the end of the lesson. A better title would be the problem of gender confusion. Okay? But like I said, I'm going to leave that to the very end. Uh, and, and again, you'll see why. But this section of Scripture we're looking at today has to do with head coverings. Today's question may, uh, you know, that might be on the minds of folks of, you know, as I, as I refer to that is, you know, are we supposed to make use of the wearing of veils or not? We, we see that in a lot of world, uh, in world religions, uh, mostly, uh, Islam is, and I forget what they call it. I want, I want to say, uh, I'm not even going to try because the, uh, I was just reading the word the other day, and I, it slipped my mind. But anyway, it's it's a veil uh, uh, that uh, that they wear. But um, but I don't want that particular question to really take away from the crux of the issue that that can get lost in this discussion, and it should not get lost because the real issue is the headship of Christ. If we get lost in, are we supposed to wear this or not wear this? Who's supposed to wear this? Who's not supposed to wear this? Are guys supposed to wear this? Are girls supposed to wear this? Are we not? You see what I'm saying? If we get lost in all of that, we're going to get, we're, 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 we're not going to spend enough time talking about the fact that Christ is the head of the church and what he says goes. Okay. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 states, He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. One version says, have preeminence in everything. And he should have preeminence. This we must not forget, because losing sight of this fact will open a floodgate of all kind of other problems. Those problems are going to be doctrinal. Those problems are going to be spiritual. Those problems are going to be salvational. So again, we need to make sure that we keep in mind what Christ says is what God expects of us to obey. 
I think that it might have been actually ingenious of Paul that he uses the present topic uh, in this section of Scripture to point this situation out. Uh, you know, do we call it the genius of Paul or do we call it the uh, providential and uh, uh, omniscience of the Almighty God? That's really that's really what it is, in fact. But let's see kind of how this unfolds. There's three points that we're going to look at. I want us to grasp just an overall historical understanding of the use of veils. Uh, and, and then we're going to talk about the headship of Christ. We need to spend some time there. Uh, and then we're going to look at the use of head coverings. You know, how, how does... How does all that? How does all that play out? So let's let's get right into this. Open your Bibles to First Corinthians chapter eleven, and let's read the first sixteen verses. Okay, so we have all of this in 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 our mind. All right. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And the man is the head of woman, and God uh, is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same with her whose head is shaved. For if a woman <clears throat> does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace... Uh, for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate for woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angel's. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. <clears throat> For as the woman originates from man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her, uh, given to her for a covering. <clears throat> but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. So there is the section of scripture that we're looking at today. So how how did you know when we look at the uh, the old covenant uh, and, and that time period, and actually even well, it's just the Old Covenant, because it covers thousands of years. It really does. Uh, <clears throat> Eastern cu uh, customs, such as the Greek, they didn't require head coverings. Because if you look at statuary from uh, New Testament times and, and earlier you can see that in the statues and artwork that there were carvings, paintings, drawings uh, of the female that was without the uh, head covering of any kind. And they would be showing all kind of, you know, fancy hairdos, you know, the, uh, you know, those complicated coifs that they do. I get the, the coif. That's a, that's a hairdresser word right there. Uh, so anyhow, um, they have all of that that stuff going on, and so you get you know from from archaeology. Then you see that head coverings in Greece or in the Greek area, Corinth actually would be a part of that. Uh, they did not; it, it wasn't common. Okay, Assyrian law. Now, when I say Assyrian law, just to put this in perspective. Uh, there is a, it, it's Assyrian law number 40, if you want to look that up sometime. Um, it, it's, a, it's a large paragraph, and it talks about uh, head coverings. Uh, basically, it, uh, head coverings were required except for slaves and prostitutes. Uh, and uh, the, that 
number 40, law, is, is real close to a law that was written back uh, 14, uh, 1450 BC. Okay, so Assyrians have practiced the use of head coverings for a long time. Jewish law, there was a strict requirement for wearing head coverings and failure to do so, according to the Mishnah written about 250 AD, uh, meant that uh, uh, there were grounds for divorce. So, you know, if the you know, husband and wife, they're going out and she's not putting her head covering on, he says, look, I've been telling you to do this, you know, and you don't want to do that. I'm divorcing you kind of thing. Then that, I guess, could happen. So anyhow, the Jews were very strict about that. There is a moral aspect behind their use. And we see that uh, uh, morally well-behaved women would wear them in front of their parents. You know, and so she might, you know, uh, at, at, at her house, uh, uh, not wear the veil, but, you know, mom and dad are going to come over for supper. And, and when they do, she would put her head covering on uh, while, they were, uh, while they were there. And their use indicated both uh, respect and modesty. Okay. Uh, yet, again, the head coverings were removed from women who were charged with adultery. Um, men would wear head coverings. And I'm going to read just a, a, a couple of passages real quick. I'm going to go to 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, we have in chapter uh, 15, uh, verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 30, and I want to read verse 32 as well. <clears throat> but they point out men wearing head coverings, but it also tells why. Um, verse 30, it says here, David went up to the ascent of Mount of Olives and wept as he went, and his head was covered, and he walked barefoot. Then all the people who were with him each covered his head and went up weeping as they went. In verse 32, it says, It happened as David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped, that behold, Hushai the archite met him with his coat torn and dust. On his head. So the so in in the case of Hushai, his head covering was dust. So why were why were the men why would the men wear head coverings? Um, it it always had to do with uh, a great uh, uh, a great difficulty. There was mourning uh, going on. There there was it, it was a time of great sadness or sorrow, and that's that's when men would cover their, uh, cover their heads. Um, <clears throat> defeat. If they, if they lost a battle, you know, they would, they would wear a uh, head covering. So there's, there's a historical use of uh, head coverings. Just kind of, you know, give us a base to where it is that we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go from verses 2 and 3, though, 1 uh, first, first Corinthians chapter 11 Paul, Paul says there uh, that I'm, I'm glad that you're holding firm to the traditions. And there's two senses of tradition that we need to make sure that we have in mind here. Because not all traditions are good. You know that? Uh, Jesus talked about some uh, traditions in a negative way in Matthew chapter 15. Uh, read with me, if you will, the first three verses of Matthew 15. He says, There then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem. Now, uh, Pharisees and scribes, they were the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees being the actual preachers, uh, so to speak. The scribes were those people who, who spent their day copying the law. And, and because they spent so much time copying God's word uh, in a very specific way, they became very knowledgeable of what God's uh, law said. Okay, so people would actually talk to scribes to get some insight uh, as regarding uh, uh, what God's word said. So, uh, <clears throat> so they come to Jesus and ask this question in verse 2, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. 
Um, Jesus responds this way. Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? What these religious leaders were doing is that they were supplanting the truth of God's word for traditions they developed. And, and I, I will honestly say these traditions were developed based upon their understanding uh, of God's word. But over the course of time, there was a greater focus on the tradition than there was on the actual thing that God said. And Jesus here points out, that's not a good thing to do. If we, if we develop traditions that are based upon God's word, that's not a bad thing. And, I, and, and, and let's, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because in this place uh, in Scripture, we see here that, that it can be a good thing. Because in chapter 2 of... <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians, verse 15, it says here, uh, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. The word letter there is the Greek word uh, epistole, which means epistle. And so when we see it saying epistle, Paul is specifically referring to these letters that the apostles wrote uh, for us. When we adhere to these writings, that is our tradition. When people adhere to these writings, they set themselves apart from negative traditions that others in the religious world will do. And I can say that coming from my eclectic religious background because I was not always a member of Christ's church. I worshiped God in other ways. And I've told you before, I thank one God, uh, one religion for te teaching me the existence of God. I thank God for the other religion which taught me the existence of Jesus. But I thank God for the church because it taught me salvation. It makes no, it makes no sense to worship God if worshiping God isn't going to get you to heaven. And there are far too many religions in, in this world doing exactly that. It's wrong. Let's hold firmly to good, foundational, solid, honest, truthful traditions. That's what... That's what Paul wants to do. In light of these traditions that he's saying, I, I, we need to understand, and I want to mention this at the start when we get into some of the uh, uh, discussion in verses uh, 5 and following uh, regarding the head coverings. Um, for, uh, it's culture. It's not command. And, and, and just so I, we don't miss this, I want you to go to, uh, go back, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to go right there to verse 15. I want to, let's look at some Greek stuff here, okay? If a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her for, uh, her hair is given to her for a covering. The word for, used twice, we see as two three-letter words. But in the Greek, they are specifically different. The first word for is the Greek word hoti, which means it, uh, it's a conjugation. In other words, <clears throat> this word is joining one phrase, the first phrase, to the second phrase. And so we have, if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. Added to, her hair is given to her for a covering. The word for, used the second time, for a covering, is the Greek word anti, which means in place of. All right? A woman's long hair is given to her in place of the use of head coverings. All right, said that. 
I didn't want to forget that. So let's go back to the headship concept here because in, in or the teaching that we get from verse 3, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of, of every man. That man is the head of woman and God is the head of Christ. Okay, God is right at the top and, and there seems to be a, a delegation of authority, a, a, a delegation of headship. It goes from God to Jesus to man to woman. Okay, and, and, and that's, that is the, uh, 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 that is the, the picture that we get from this, this particular verse here. Why is Jesus uh, placed above us? Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, uh, a couple of lengthier readings here, but in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, we're going to read through verse 11. And we have to read all of this to help us understand exactly why Jesus holds uh, such a place of preeminence. And, and he says here, uh, <clears throat> beginning in verse 5, chapter 2, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in, in uh, the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being uh, thus made in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, therefore, because of everything that went before, therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so there we have the... Uh, the reason that Jesus holds that place of preeminence is because of what he did for us. He left his position with God in heaven, came to earth and dwelt among us. Uh, we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten uh, of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. Um, and, 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 and he died on the cross. He sacrificed himself. You know, and it's, it's the obedience involved. He lived a sinless, perfect life. He became that perfect sacrifice that we so desperately need. That's what Jesus did. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 1, the first four verses. <clears throat> the idea that we get from uh, this is, uh, it, it, it's just... There's there's some imagery and teaching that God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance, he being Jesus, is the radiance of his glory, his God, and the exact, uh, the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of uh, majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And again, uh, that's talking about that relationship, that special relationship between God uh, and Christ and the position that Christ now holds and why he holds that position and the teaching that we receive from the position that Jesus now holds. And so all that, that is, that is exactly why uh, Paul uh, uh, is pointing out such importance on the headship that is involved in this context. So in the remaining verses of first Corinthians chapter uh, 11, we have here, in our context here through verse 16, it's, it's the use of 
the uh, head coverings. And so uh, men were not in the practice, again, of using head coverings. Um, but one of the reasons that they didn't or that they did wear them besides the uh, mourning and uh, defeat and, you know, uh, suffering uh, was that head coverings were a sign of being under subjugation or submission to uh, foreigners. And so if you were captured, you know, and you had to wear a particular clothing, that clothing was a sign of uh, possession by by somebody else. Head coverings are important. Um, I, interactive portion of the sermon. Can I can I ask you real quick, Aaron? When you're out on your patrols, do you wear a a hat? No. You haven't. Um, there are uh, there are other places though where policemen wear hats. Um, you'll see the. Uh, uh, if you see uh, images of policemen in cities like Chicago and New York, uh, they will wear hats. Uh, firemen used to wear hats. Um, in, when I was in the Marine Corps, there were basically three different hats that were worn. There was the drill instructor hat. And, and if you saw somebody wearing this hat, uh, that guy, that man, that woman wearing that particular hat, they had a very, very important job. And their job uh, within an 11 to 13 week period, they were to break down an individual and then build them back up. They had to remove from that individual all kinds of bad habits. And then they had to instill within that individual habits that they never likely had before in their life. Okay, there's that hat. Uh, uh, I, as an enlisted man in two different branches of the service, um, w- as a Marine, I, w- I would have my, we call it a cover, okay? We would have our cover that we would wear. When I was in the Army National Guard, um, our cover could at times also have on the front of it our rank. In the Marine Corps, our rank was never put on our cover. It didn't make a difference if you were Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. Uh, the top most uh, uh, enlisted uh, position to a private just out of boot camp. Their cover was always the same. Um, and then, of course, the officer's cover uh, that uh, was worn. But even in times of combat and training, uh, officers in the Marine Corps had the same cover everybody else did. Uh, but anyway, um, the point is, is that it, it, was, uh, it was an identifier of sorts. And so that's kind of what we have here. Women were encouraged to wear the veil in Corinth due to the need to increase the moral separation between the church and the community in which they lived and served. This is very important for us to understand, okay? Okay. Um, if, if we go to an area, you know, if we're going to do mission work someplace and we're trying to set up, you know, a, uh, I really have to be careful here, uh, because there is a, uh, a brother in Christ that did a whole lot of work in South Africa, uh, and, and the problem, and this was a problem amongst the teachers, amongst the staff. Um, and he concluded that head coverings were a cultural thing. It's not something that, uh, scripture commands, you know, um, but it's not to say that head coverings can't in some situations serve a good purpose. And that's kind of what we find here in the Corinth church. There was, it was a highly immoral area. Um, it was, uh, it was a port. There was a naval port there, had a lot of traffic coming into that, uh, in and out of there from all over the, uh, all over the world. Um, it was a melting pot of sorts. People would bring in their ideas, their concepts, you know, their culture, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, and it would end up becoming a part of uh, the city of Corinth and the people who lived there. 
And, and Paul says we need to make sure that we are the peculiar people that Peter describes we ought to be. We are a peculiar people. We're different from the world. And so Paul encouraged the use of head coverings uh, for this particular situation there. But again, again, to remind us, verse 15, a woman's long hair is given to her in place of the head covering. Okay? And, uh, yeah, so, anyway, uh, it should also be noted that archaeology bears proof that this practice in Corinth was not widespread in the Christian world among, un among other Gentile converts at that time. Imagery of Christians were found in the catacombs, showing that the veil was not being worn consistently throughout the Christian realm. Within Jewish converts, though, the veil, again, was consistently worn. Um, even in our, again, in our context, uh, uh, Paul discusses the fact that a woman's hair, again, serves uh, in place of the material uh, head covering. So <clears throat> there's a difference here between long hair and short hair. And if you do any kind of history work, you will find that there was a group of men uh, called Spartans. Would anybody agree that Spartans were not women? I, but Spartans had shoulder-length hair. Their hair was about how long mine was when I was in high school. I could go like this and reach back and grab my hair. And that was, that was a long time ago. I, if I did that today, it would just really, it would just be weird. You know what I'm saying? So anyhow, I'll, I'll just, you know, anyway. Uh, I just keep praying that my hair will stop, you know, fading here. And yeah, okay, my hair is short. All right, uh, but the 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 point is is that there there is a separation between men's roles, women's roles, all that kind of stuff. There's some symbolic meaning, the the sim symbology behind wearing uh, these veils. I'm going to go through uh, some passages here pretty quick. Uh, if you want the notes, you're welcome to have those. But 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, Then Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, Has not the Lord anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? The 21st Psalm, verse 3, For you meet him with the blessing of good things. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. Um. We're seeing some things about what the head represents, right? It's a place where a person's anointed. It's where a person wears a crown. Don't fear what you're about to suffer, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 says. Behold, the devil's about to cast some of you in prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. All right? Now, it's how do you put a crown of life on top of somebody's gourd. This is the whole phraseology behind this passage in Revelation has nothing to do with, with something that's actually worn on the head. But the head is used because of what it represents. Okay? Uh, uh, Psalm 8, 5, Yet you have made him a little lower than God and, and have crowned him with glory and majesty. Uh, Proverbs chapter 14. Y'all are about chapter 14 in the class in here, right? 14? 18? Okay, so you all have already read this in the adult class. Uh, chapter 14, verse 18 of Proverbs, the naive inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Proverbs 16, 31, a gray head is, the, is a crown of glory. Uh, it's found in the way of righteousness. Um, Leviticus 19, uh, verse 32, kind of coupled with that particular passage, says that you shall rise up before the gray-headed and honor the aged. You shall revere your God, I am the Lord. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 11, His head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 5, Your head crowns you like Carmel. And the flowing locks of your head are like purple threads. Uh, people have, uh, I work with a gal who's got purple hair. Um, well, sometimes it's orange and then sometimes it's green. So she just, 
whatever the mood of the day is, you know, break out the spray paint. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, 22 says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Now you could say then that the eye, which is a part of the head, is a window to the soul, okay? And so our, our head displays all kind of stuff. <laughs> you could look at somebody's face and find out what kind of mood they're in, right? Happy, you know, sad. Uh, you know, we've seen all of those... Uh, how many different smiley face icons are they? And they just kind of run the gamut, don't they? You know, um, but all of them are heads with a with a line representing the mouth in different positions and eyes doing different things shut, you know, or or open or whatever. You see what I'm saying? That's that's what the head does. And so, you know, we've worked again the. Uh, the idea of head coverings here. And so what is what is our takeaway? How are we supposed to deal with all this? Western culture, where we live, we don't use veils here. Our using them here would people just think we're nuts. All right? They think we're nuts enough as it is without having to add to the nutsery. Right? And, and so it, it's just, yeah. For the sake of angels, though, because you know what? Angels are mentioned here, aren't they? Um, why should women wear head coverings, wear veils for the sake of angels? Uh, what does that mean? I, I think there's two things that that maybe we should think about and ponder. It may be one, it may be the other, it may be a combination of both. But <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, what does that tell us there? Some have entertained angels unaware. All right? And so, you know, the got the head covering, and so it's basically saying, you know, we're the head covering for the sake of the angels. And so I want to, uh, you know, speaking from the lady position, I'm going to wear my... Uh, my head covering, my veil, uh, because I I do not want to uh, hinder whatever ministry this particular angel might be uh, uh, involved in next to me kind of thing, right? Um, maybe, like Jude verse 6 says, and the angels that did not keep their original authority but abandoned their proper sphere he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change for the, change for the uh, judgment of the great day. And so maybe uh, the idea here is that it's saying don't disregard authority that God has placed over you so that you don't suffer the same fate that these angels suffered. If that's the case, that is information that just doesn't go to women. It goes to men also. All right? Let's, let's, let's just keep in mind that in God's mind, women were, were never an afterthought. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it, it, it says, and he created them male and female. All right? The, uh, uh, when he says, let us make man in our image, chapter 1, verse 26. You know what the word for man is in that passage? It is the word Adam. It can be directly translated human species. We're all in this room humans, and we're either male or female. Okay? And, and so we all have a role in God's creation. And we need to understand what our role is and, and then go for it with great gusto, right? That's what we should. Dr. Walter Clark, uh, he is a uh, friend of mine. He, he preaches up in the Dakotas. Uh, he, he has a, he has a uh, commentary, a devotional commentary covering First and Second Corinthians. Um, and he says that this section of scripture 
is all about uh, gender confusion, you know, the gender issues, because what was really taking place when you look at what's going on here, men were wearing veils and women were not. There was a lot of what we would call cross-dressing going on. And uh, Paul is saying, hey, that's, that's, not a good, that's not a good thing, you know, to be involved in. It, we need to make sure that we are uh, uh, maintaining the place where God created us to be. And I think that's another reason why Paul was stressing the use of veils in the Corinth area, you know, to help folks in that area understand God created men and God created women. Okay? Um, that is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 16. Do you live your life confused with what authority is or is not? Remember, Jesus is the head of the church. If you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus as the Lord of your life, we're going to offer an invitation song here in just a moment, and, and uh, just uh, come forward here, and uh, we'll find out specifically a little bit more about what it is that you're wanting, and we'll do everything in our power to meet your need. Uh, if you just want to know more about what the Church of Christ is, we can help you there too. Um, I would suggest, keep this in mind, all one word, churchofyourchoice.com. Churchofyourchoice.com. Take about 13 and a half minutes of your time to watch that video. Uh, it is really, really good. It does a really... Uh, good, it's kind of broad in scope, but it does a really good job of explaining why Christ's church is so different and so necessary for you uh, compared to everything else that the world has to offer. So if there's any way that we can serve you today, won't you come forward while we stand and sing?